Please undo that, Yummy. Hi, Matthew. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Yeah, great, thank you so much. Of course, and hi, everybody. Today, we're talking with Matthew Nozier. These hi, are guys. four pieces that we just got in that we're really excited to share with you as we have not sent them out to anybody yet, nor have they been posted on our social media. So I hope you guys enjoy our talk today and this introduction to Matthew and his work. So these are four pieces that were made I think towards the end of last year, would you say? Late yeah, they were, yeah, they were finished actually on the 31 at 8 p.m. So, <laughs> <laughs> right last, before our 2020. Mm -hmm. And these are all oil on MDF board. Um, and so today I'd like to have them prompt our conversation about getting to know you a bit more, um, some past work you've done, how it relates to you today, and all that influences, inspires you. So my husband, Joseph, who operates a gallery with me, was one of the um, ones to find your work before me. So I was thrilled when he shared it with me because it embodied visually and thematically everything that we love as people, mm -hmm. but also professionally for the gallery. You intermingle different times. So you have elements of the past and mythology with what's current and perhaps a sense of the future too. And you bring in dualities and elements of cultures from all over the world and it really mm -hmm. creates this harmonious and unifying aesthetic and theme that I think brings people together and and I don't know it's just you get completely lost into it the stories that you build the characters and the allegorical associations with them too I think are extremely engaging and they're painted magnificently too so if you don't mind first telling us a bit about your background, I know you studied in Romania, um, you were born in France, but you traveled quite a bit too. How does that all come yeah. into play and reflect in your artwork? Yeah, exactly. So after high school, I moved to Belgium uh, to, st to start studying comic books. Ah. So I was really into drawing and telling stories. Um, and in second year, I met a uh, a person from Romania, which was doing like an Erasmus here in Belgium, or there in Belgium, sorry. And um, she was a painter and she showed me a book from a Russian artist named Valentin Serov, the student of Repin. And that was the first time I was really, how to say, like totally shocked. Uh, I discovered the, the work of this guy and I felt like, okay, I want to do that. Suddenly everything disappeared, uh, comics, whatever. And then I left to Romania to study painting there because I knew that in Cluj they had like a good school for that. And that's how I, yeah, I caught up with painting. And since I, I kept with that, I mean, with this medium. And from the comics, I, I kept the, the narrative sense, the, the um, how to say, the will to to build an image to tell something to tell a story to to have like a whole world inside a, inside a painting mm. and after i graduated from a master in fine arts so in painting i just kept traveling according to various opportunities i had because i'm i always like love to discover new cultures and that can feed my work and also meet new artists that can you know, teach me new things and stuff. So yeah, that's how, how it went. Absolutely. And it's something I'm sure you'll continue to do as far as meeting other artists and traveling and pulling inspiration from the stories mm -hmm. of cultures and societies, both past and present. Yeah, exactly. So someone had asked just for your name again. Um, his name is Matthew Nozier yeah. and his Instagram is that too. So mm -hmm. if you guys need me to send it to you at the end, just let me know. And as always, send more questions over as they come up. So in looking back into your previous work, you have worked with color before. So tell us a bit about why you chose um, to segue into a monochromatic palette and how you find color or lack thereof accentuates and embraces the stories you tell. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, actually, um, I'm always jumping between monochromatic works and colored works. I think it's more a matter of series. Like sometimes I feel that the monochromatic is going to really help the work and help the, the subject and the content. And sometimes I feel like color is going to bring something more. Uh, so it it's really, um, it depends on, uh, really depends on the series. Like the, the, the four works you're showing now, it was definitely clear in my mind that they have to be monochromatic and this kind of, and have this kind of bluish tint. Mm. So and, yeah, this is an aesthetic choice depending on the subject. And do you find that you use it to produce a certain type of mood or to kind of change the visual interpretation of the story? Oh, sorry, say again? So when you choose to work with a monochromatic palette, such as mm -hmm. what's exemplified in these pieces, do you choose to do so because of the mood you wish to convey or is it a part of the story? I know you said it's um, aesthetic, but would you be able to elaborate more on that? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so it's part of the mood for these works. I wanted them to have a, a kind of, uh, I don't know how you would say that in English, kind of a depth atmosphere. Like there is a lot of things going on, for instance, in this work, you can feel like the movement and everything. But the monochromatic mm -hmm. gives it a very, very, how to say, heavy and calm state, which contrasts yes. with like, the image, which is quite active. And the image itself, it, it has almost an uplifting effect too, because although she's she's being attacked, if I'm understanding mm -hmm. correctly, she still has confidence and hope and, and faith and she stands very strongly. Yeah, there is a, the, the, to have a contrast is, is something very important in my work. Like if you have something very active, you're gonna have something very quiet nearby and and you're exactly right like the horses and the carriage is going really crazy but the figure is is very peaceful she has the eyes closed and she's standing like in a like she's not moved or whatever right she's in a, a strong but still pose while all the activity and the action is occurring around her and it, it conveys a really mm -hmm. beautiful message as far as to meditate calmness and to accept your surroundings but also work to you know fight them as needed but in a you know a therapeutic manner taking time to think about things yeah exactly and so the idea of duality then is very present in your work as you have a very active but a very still look to many of your pieces and with that when you work in a monochromatic palette you have the high value points of the whites where you have i'm not sure if there's it's black present or if it's a very dark blue but again you have that low point mm -hmm. high point value and use of contrast and color so tell us why balance and engaging in dualities is important for you and your work i think it's it's linked with philosophy somehow um i i don't really separate painting from life and the more I learn to paint, the more I learn to live and the way around. So life is full of duality, of contrast, of like finding a balance and finding in my work I am also for me it's oops. It's still like okay. Yeah, because it's a big part of human beings' life, so for me, it should be a big part of painting, too. I think so, also. And a question has popped up. I feel like the color mm -hmm. palette creates a perspective where the landscape behind the action is the narrator. Sort of a third-person, ominescent viewpoint. Is that accurate? Oh, well, that's a very interesting point. Yes, I, I think, think so. I think, yeah, once again, um, we're all dependent of our environment, right? We react to it. We are being different if we live in one environment or the other. So perhaps that's why I also take care to really give a certain soul to the, to the, um, the, the, the landscape and all the things around the characters. And I'm really glad someone could could feel that vibe and, and point it out. 
Absolutely. Thank you for that great question and, and noticing that about Matthew's work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. So there's also with all the man-made elements like architecture, for instance, and then you have humans and their cloth, and they may not represent a specific period of time, but they do mm -hmm. echo the past in certain ways. You also have nature taking its role. And it's not just about the role, let's say, where you have the use of horses to transport, but there is the landscape itself that is quite natural and an intermingling of your organic with what we know is human. Do you mind elaborating more on the coexistence between the two in your work? So I'm, I'm not sure I understood the question. Sorry. Uh, you, you, Sorry. you asked like the, the, the link that there is between the, um, let's say the, the wild and the humans. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I use a lot of horses and birds in my work probably because they, first it's two animals that people know well, like most, most of us have seen a horse and a bird, so they can, they can somehow visually relate. And it's, again, two animals that are somehow opposite. Like the horse is very heavy, it's powerful, it's on the ground, the bird is very light and is in the air. But both um, has this kind of freedom in them. Like even if the horse is carrying someone, you, it's still an, an animal that, symbolizes certain strength and freedom and the bird is the same so that's why i choose these two animals and for me it's important to integrate wild and animals in my work besides and be, and next to humans because i believe that um, we're all one like nature is also something very important very linked with us and that's why these two like human beings and animals usually coexist in my in my work Absolutely, that connectivity is very important to note and, and very mm -hmm. true too. Yeah, exactly. And so the, the choice to add the cats, was it part of a thematic element within the story here? Or did they represent or symbolize something within this piece? Yeah, so the cats, um, be, because they, 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 we don't know if they, or they uh, for me, they rather play, but they, they are here to symbolize also a certain duality because these women are having like a vision of, with the character on the on the rooftop, and they are uh, there is a separation between this woman on her horse, which is uh, free, and the other women, which are like beyond the walls, like uh, not beyond the wall, the way around, sorry, in front of the walls, and the cat somehow symbolizes yeah, this. Uh, this kind of inner fight that can happen. And on the more, how to say, compositional way, uh, aspect, they add a bit of natural to the scene because everything is very, very, very static and calm in this painting and the cat somehow brings a little, a little twist, you know. I think so, and a, and a playfulness too that warms it up, as you had said, the other elements mm -hmm. are a bit more stagnant and cold. Yeah. And so each painting that you create has a story behind it where you elaborate a little bit more on, on what it signifies. Do you mind sharing that with each piece so we can learn more about your insight? Yeah, sure, sure. So on this piece, I lived in Morocco uh, in 2018 for a year and it's inspired me a lot. That's why there is a lot of um, Orientalist kind of um, elements in my work because this was a very important year for me. And this background is really taken directly like from, from place there. I mix, you know, like uh, Middle East Arabic kind of patterns with like uh, Northern African Moroccan. So it's, it's a little bland, but still it's like Oriental. And the painting here talks about like women's rights because I remember when I was there, um, women not always had uh, the same freedom as men. And this really, uh, how to say, uh, is not shocked me, but it made me feel wrong. And I said, I, I'd like to paint something in, as, a, as a tribute somehow to, to women's rights all over the world. And yeah, hopefully one day they, they'll be totally equal to us, I mean, to men. And so you have all women in this particular piece. You have the one on the horse. And what does she represent? 
So the woman on the horse is dressed as a traditional um, Moroccan fighter. So she is uh, dressed with a male outfit. So she's on the wing horse and she is inside of a um, uh, how to say male warrior costume. So that's also symbolizing uh, the fact that she can have the, the same uh, position and the same um, weight as a man. And she's on a winged horse, so she's free. And somehow these three women, which are locked down in the in the Riyadh, and it could also make think of a harem back in the in time, are are looking at her, but we can't see their faces. We don't know if they are like admiring this person, or if they are scared, or if they are happy, or whatever. So that's up to the viewer to to build his own story. And I think that makes it really special because as viewers, we're always going to place our own experiences and emotions and who we are onto what we're looking at. So perhaps mm -hmm. one day we're feeling inspired and empowered and perhaps this figure over here is that symbol of hope and of you know change and equality among genders. And at other times mm -hmm. we might feel like we could be a bit sad or feel a little helpless in any situation, not even gender specific. And I think that mm -hmm. it's wonderful when art doesn't give too much away, it gives you the basic ingredients and it's up to that viewer to piece them together to create their own interpretation. And again, that can change and that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, exactly. It's important when you're making a painting to always leave a space where the, the, um, the viewer can become an actor in your, in your painting. Absolutely. And do you find that to be challenging to find the balance of giving enough ingredients, but at the same time, leaving it open for interpretation? Yeah, it's quite challenging because it's like cooking, you know, you never know if it's too much salt or not enough. So you, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the work, like when you're sketching before the starting the painting, I'm trying many things and I, I'm, I sketch in, in little, you know, so just I can arrange and try many things. Yeah, to find the right Absolutely. balance. So let's move on to the next painting. If you don't mm -hmm. mind continuing your story background and letting us yeah. know a bit more. So this one, it's called uh, The Calm During the Storm. Um, because usually that, that's coming from a French saying, which says that uh, after the storm, like things are getting calmer. So I don't know how to translate that in English. But then I thought that it would be interesting to try to to be calm during the storm. So I painted this big wave, which represents like the hard times everyone can have when you're emotionally like in a, in a like in trouble in the middle of an inner storm. And yet there is this little bird up there which is flying above, and in the bird in the bird's uh, how to say in the zone of the bird. Everything is very calm. He's in the air. The wave is down, right? And right. down in the wave zone, it's crazy. So this painting talks about this little distance that one might always have during like difficult events. And this might really help him to, to, to how to say, to pass this storm because whether you are inside the wave or outside the wave, it's going to be the same, the same, how to say, um, the same effect in the, the, the same scenario it's just that during the scenario you can be a little with a little distance so you pass it like peacefully and you're not like <laughs> crushed somehow yeah. was that clear enough sorry no, sometimes it's more that's clear, great think. no you've been doing a really wonderful job and oh, so yeah. I, I think it's it's again one of these pieces where there can be dual meanings because i see that but i certainly see a little bit of the fact that whether or not you can kind of outrun and separate yourself from something tumultuous and something like a storm, it still has certain effects that affect us all. And it has a unifying sense because whether you're beneath the waves or above mm. them or, or in them, we're all affected in some way. And it, it kind of connects yeah. with all, both the natural world and our human, you know, civilized world, if you will. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The, the, bird, the bird symbolizes like our spirit or mind and the wave is like our life somehow. Yeah. yeah. And that, as Daniel commented, um, it's a very appropriate message for right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's true. <laughs> Absolutely true. I mean, I don't think ever have we all on such a grand scale across the entire world been, you know, unified in, in such a way, a terrible way. But we're all truly mm -hmm. in this together. And it's a great thing that we can connect <laughs> with you all the way. Are you in France right now? 
Yeah, I'm in France. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're in quarantine also. And I hope all you guys are safe because we hear the news from here and it's like in the state, it's, it seems to be really scary. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's very bad here. We're a bit slower mm. to respond, but it's much more complex than I understand. So I can't yeah. really comment. I just like to talk about art. <laughs> so mm. I, I keep it there. So I know we touched upon this painting already, but I, I would like to continue. So mm -hmm. this is the largest piece that we have from you called Freedom Chased by Memories. Yeah. So if you don't mind now elaborating more on her story, the placement of the Egyptian god Anubis, um, as well as the landscape, because it does seem a bit different and identifiable, perhaps it's someplace west. But let me know, please, because I'd love to know more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this one is like a, a, a how to say, a resume um, of my my past two years somehow. Um, there is like Morocco inside, there is China, uh, there is some Egyptian symbol and uh, this kind of American West uh, landscape. So this painting is entitled um, Freedom Chased by Memories. So as you might have guessed, the woman standing on a carriage is the symbol of freedom and the people attacking are like memories. So this is linked with a hard personal time I had in Morocco when I lived there. And um, the, the work is talking about when someone has a bad experience, you know, even though you move on, you still from time to time have this kind of ghost from the past that strikes in your mind and that doesn't seem to want to let you go. So this, this, from this idea and this feeling I had, I said, I have to, to, to create a painting talking about this. So um, the people attacking the carriage are Moroccan riders. So they are linked to the memory from Morocco. And the people which are, the guy which is defending the carriage is a Chinese traditional warrior. Why is that? It's because after Morocco, I went to work in China. So China helped me to make a transition with that like bad uh, personal experience I had. And, and that's why the, the, there is a duality again with the Chinese warrior and the Moroccan guy. And still the Chinese warrior seems to win. Like it, I, we, I don't think the Moroccan guy is gonna reach the carriage because the, in his position, you can see it's, he's probably gonna fall. And the carriage is drive, uh, drove sorry, by um, Anubis. I use this character a lot in my work because you know it's the funeral um, god from Egypt. And for me, I use it in a way that he symbolizes the transition, like the passage between one state to another. So it can be from life to death, but it can, in, in some of my works, also just be from one state to another one. So here he symbolizes the, the, the shift that I did from this um, bad memory I had towards like future, from past to futures, uh, let's say. And uh, the freedom is holding like the, um, symbol, the, the Egyptian cross, which is symbol of life. So it means like life goes on, you go forward. And it has a, lit, a lot of little symbols here and there. For instance, the two ribbons, black and white, you know, they are here to show that sometimes in our lives, the, the good and the, and, and the evil somehow mixes and you don't really know why but yeah it, it happens that it's both like sun and, and lightings in the same time in, in some yeah periods so they're here for that the big cloud behind is symbolizing that whatever happens even if it's heavy it's massive everything moves everything change everything is organic everything will change shapes and everything and um, the horses, you can notice that there is one which is like on track and the other one is like, woof, it's going to the left. And then you can feel there's a clip, the landscape stops. And Anubis is really trying to keep the horses on, on track, you know, because once again, two horses, duality, sometimes uh, one is gonna go somewhere where it's gonna be chaos or tragedy and another one is like keeping on track. So this work is really, based on contrast duality and as you, as you said previously. Yeah, uh, I can absolutely. absolutely see that. And I think you did a really beautiful job as far as balancing so many disparate things like your personal experiences with those that people can also connect with because they embark upon more universal 
elements, ideas that good mm -hmm. coexist with evil, and you need one without the other, and they intertwine at times. And the idea yeah, that, definitely. yeah, that, you know, you have these past cultural elements, these mythologies, or these figures um, of different times, different places, but how they all work together in a sense for good and for bad, but nonetheless, everything exists together. And yeah, exactly. Whole, yeah, demonstrating, um, you know, the one that seems to be more on track or the other one might go off the cliff and, and having this very powerful um, mythological god from ancient Egypt, kind of being the mm -hmm. one that is a bit more in, in control and in representing the continuation of something that is always inevitable is very clear. And it's a very dynamic and exciting painting but also quite beautiful and peaceful because of how she has her eyes closed and the way that she's standing and the, the confidence and strength in her posture as well as her outspread ring. So, yeah, it's yeah, a really exactly. I mean, my work, my work are never having a sad conclusion, let's say. I'm, they're always about like hope and, yeah. um, and all these kind of things. So I'm glad you could notice that overall the, stand, the figure which stands the highest in this painting is really peaceful and she's calm and confident Absolutely. somehow. Absolutely. It's important to not ignore the hardships in life and not ignore the dark sides of it because it helps us appreciate and value the, the brightness and the goodness um, that we come out of all those dark moments and experiences with. So mm -hmm. I thank you for constantly tackling that in your work and, and doing such a poetic and, and beautiful job in doing so. Mm. Oh, and the landscape, why it's American, that can be strange also. It's uh, because right now I am willing to pursue my career in the States and I'm working on like uh, paperwork to emigrate there. So I thought that putting this, because this painting is like a resume of this, of like two years of, of living, I thought that uh, putting the, an American landscape where I want to evolve from now, it also makes sense. I think that's great. And I think that one of the many attractive aspects about your work is the intermingling of different cultures, different genders, different periods of time, and also different mythologies. I think that it's a very unifying um, force. And mm -hmm. it's something that's quite important because we all are people at the end of the day, just with differences. And if we can learn from each other and be open minded towards one another, it makes for a much more beautiful conclusion and future. Yeah, exactly. Totally. And so um, someone had asked, this painting is called Freedom Chased by Memories. Mm -hmm. And before we move on to the next painting, um, Gina has a really, actually two great questions. She said, your equine work is perfectly defined. Do you have a personal connection with horses? And does the figure represent a strong woman in your life? Oh, so, um, no, the figure is more of uh, the idea of uh, the symbol of freedom. I actually painted the character from my mind. I didn't use um, a person to, as a model, or I didn't represent someone from my mind. It's it's really a symbolic kind of character. And regarding the horses, I don't know. I always loved horses since I'm a kid. And the more I was growing as an artist, the more I found them fascinating because they are really a kind of animal which totally suits art and especially drawing or painting because they have all the ingredients that basically you want your work to have as an artist. They are like powerful and massive in the same time, very thin and refined. They have a lot of movement like in their hair or their neck and in the same time, their ankles are so stiff. So they are great they're an, an animal that is visually so complete that it's super inspiring when you're a painter or a draftsman. And it, it certainly has those balances and those dualities that you like. And I think historically they're incredibly important because they're a source in, in both you know history, but also in fantastical stories that many of us grew up with, like yeah. Lord of the Rings and um, other mm -hmm. times uh, are medieval centered pieces, if you will, you, you have that element. So I think it, it gives a heart back to history, it hearts to the surrealistic qualities of many stories we've all grown up with. But also it highlights the balance, as you mentioned, between the majesty and the beauty, but also the ferocity and the wild, you know, qualities yeah, that exactly. these horses can have. So it, it does a number of things. And going off of Gina's question, actually, because it did make me think more about this, because females play a strong role in these particular pieces, would you say that there has been a female figure in your life that has 
strongly affected you or an experience, as you mentioned, I think in Morocco, was it? You did notice um, a difference in the treatment of women. Am I recalling that correctly? Oh, so you're asking if I've noticed difference between women and men in Morocco? Um, you were, when you were explaining your time in Morocco, you had mentioned that it inspired you to kind of tackle the idea of enforcing visually gender equality. Because mm -hmm. it did you upset, was it in Morocco that it had upset you when you saw something um, or was it something yeah, yeah. else? Yeah, in, uh, I mean, I was living in the most traditional city of the country. And there, um, I mean, with my mindset, which uh, somehow is artistic, there are many things that I didn't find right. And um, yeah, between men and women, like the women basically didn't have at all the same rights, the same freedom as men. And, and yeah, that, <laughs> that annoyed me there. But in the same time, what could I do? It's a whole country, it's a whole culture. Uh, but then I thought like, okay, I don't want to be political or anything, but on this philosophical kind of thing, I want to talk about equality and into genders. And probably that's why in this painting, for instance, you cannot really say when this happens. Maybe it's 19th century, maybe it could be now also with just traditional outfit because I don't want to point something in particular like a period or a certain person or whatever. I just want to stay like broad and talk about the concept of uh, of equality and not really point Morocco and this kind of person and situation and, and, and what city or whatever. So I, I try to have a, a broad universal message that is taken, it's true, in my personal experiences. But in the end, in the painting, I want it to be like quite universal rather than specific. And I think that you achieved that with the amb ambiguity, as you'd mentioned, of not pinpointing a specific time, having elements yeah. of a certain location, but there still is some level of mystery and wonder, where is this? When was this? And what does it represent? And outside of Morocco, Obviously, as we all know, issues like that still exist and pervade yeah, society, exactly. even in the most mm -hmm. developed. And so it's a wonderful notion to kind of keep in mind. And going from there, um, were there any very pivotal figures, um, female figures in your life that have helped shape you, um, whether they're artists or parental figures or friends? Yes, many. Actually, the first person that made me discover uh, this painting through this book from Serov was a female. She's a Romanian artist named Magda Amariore. And she, yeah, she taught me so many things about painting. So actually the first, my first teacher, let's say in painting was a, was a female. And, and so many of my friends are, are uh, super gifted painters and they're female and, and they keep telling me that they are struggling sometimes in the art world because of that. And I find this so unfair. So yeah, they are like incredible female artists everywhere and and incredible uh i'll say that in english female non-artists like normal people and, yes, and everyone people. have the same rights you know it's the fact that in 2020 where it's still like a man's world it's it's just not okay well, i certainly agree and i'm sure that many of those watching do too and i think using an allegorical approach like you do and like you have and probably will continue to do in depicting females and going back to kind of not having a specific time or location, um, but a, an amalgamation of different cultures, times, clothing, um, natural world versus civilized world, and so on and so forth, really allows for that message to come out clearly. I mean, she has, for mm -hmm. me, elements of somebody from antiquity also, um, balancing it with the ancient Egyptian character, um, the Chinese warrior, as well as the Moroccan. So. It's a really wonderful balance and intermingling of, of so many different elements that I think allows your work to have a more universal reach in general. Mm -hmm. and yeah, so hopefully. The and next so question um, mm -hmm. says, this work is very beautiful and the blend of so many cultures are really so well done. The masks, faces and the carriage, do they signify anything? So actually, I don't really know. I felt like I need to put this mask. It made sense but I can't really say why. This is the kind of elements that sometimes you had perhaps inconsciently 
and maybe in a in a while I will understand exactly why I, I put this mask, but even I don't really know. <laughs> so if the person which asked yeah. the question has, uh, has an explanation, uh, I'll, I'll take it. Yeah, I mean, I see them, it's hard to tell. Like when I first saw them, they looked more like the, the door knockers for me that you would see in Paris, yeah. for instance, many of the exactly. doors. That was the so, reference I created to from the door knocker. Yeah, I definitely see that. And I remember being in Paris in September of last year and, and stopping with my husband quite frequently just to love and, and um, find ourselves losing, you know, our, our, our time just taking in these door knockers mm -hmm. and these beautiful details. So perhaps in many, many years, we can kind of date this back to, you know, Paris or a specific location. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so sometimes in your painting, you paint something and only a while after you understand why you did it. That's weird, but yeah, it, yeah. it happens. It's great. And it, it goes back to the idea that, you know, paintings are living, you know, things. They're not inanimate. I mean, they may be still, but they have that brushstroke, as you guys can see here, of the artist. Mm -hmm. There is a human play but at the same time the works grow as you grow and they change as you change so years yeah, exactly. later you may see something you never noticed before or you may interpret something differently and even more beautiful when you have guests over and when you bring people in your home for the first time they're now having different interpretations as you are so now they're giving you this insight and this story that you may not have come to and so it opens up your mind and it allows you to grow as a person too so it's kind of something that's always going to keep giving yeah. And so moving on to the next painting. So mm -hmm. this is a piece um, that I believe you've explored a couple times in a few different ways working with scale as well. Um, the boy with the mm -hmm. horse. Would you mind telling us more about this piece, who he represents, why you kind of um, interpreted him a couple different ways and what that represents to you? Yeah, so that is the third version of it. So the first version was really big. It's like two meter on 180 so i don't really know how much it is in inches but yeah it's it's wide and this one is the smallest of the, the versions so this painting i had i was in india in the south of india in buducherry i was like walking near the seashore and i've seen that boy on the on the white horse and he was probably very poor i think he was like trying to earn some money with tourists, you know, that he would make them ride the, his horse around. And I remember that the image of that boy on his horse really touched me, probably because the, 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 the boy clearly looked probably from Shanti Towns or something because he was like on the painting, he's in flip flops, you know, riding his horse. But he, he had like such a powerful energy like the way he looked at me when I asked him if I can take him in picture, he was very, with a very noble kind of pose and look. And I was very impressed. I said, I really have to pay homage to the, to this guy and, and paint him. And then when I, when I, was, back, I was back in the studio in Europe, I changed many things. The, the wall uh, saddle, the wall elements, the background, it doesn't look like India here. It's more like a rocky kind of uh, landscape, but still there's the sea. And the idea behind this painting was to, to bring in a very powerful and magnificent stature someone which in his daily life probably is not even looked or cared by, by others, you know? So it's like, now, like once the painting is hanged in a, in a gallery, people watch this person and and I wanted to bring him somehow this attention that perhaps he, he didn't have on, uh, in his daily life. And I think it also makes one remember that it's, it's how you perceive the world and mm -hmm. how you attack and experience every day. And my grandmother always used to tell me, it's not the horse, but the rider. It's about you as a person. And despite your mm -hmm. circumstances, you can make it you know, into a better situation and, and you can still find a lot more about yourself and learn and grow. And it's all a part of being alive and, and having this life and the ability to cognitively work with what you know and also um, expand that through whatever means does that for you. Yeah. And exactly. so 
this particular figure, it's it's obviously, as you mentioned, a portrait of this young man that inspired you. I mean, his posture mm -hmm. is very strong. He's quite confident in his, you know, I don't want to say like management of the horse because that sounds a little, you know, anti-animal rights. But, you know, in India, I'm sure that animals, and here actually in the U.S. are not treated the best. But nonetheless, um, he still has that, that regality that someone of his financial stature may not you know, typically have. And it's a very beautiful thing because, again, it shows perception. It shows how you choose to view and attack your life. And with that being said, he is wearing very contemporary clothing, which is <laughs> something that I noticed um, you don't really do or you haven't done in the rest of the series. No. So tell me why you chose to depict him as he was when you saw him and not clothe him in some kind of, you know, period style garb. Yes, probably because... On this painting, I really wanted this boy in particular to be the, the, the character. He is not here symbolizing something or a certain idea. I really wanted to pay homage, homage or homage, I don't know how you say this in English, to this person in particular that really impressed me. So I moved a lot of things, actually. The horse is not the same. Nothing is the same besides that guy, and I kept his clothes the same. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it's, you know, it's very noticeable, but it, it really is very moving, especially now finding out the story behind that piece. And mm -hmm. why did you choose this particular horse? Was it because he re represented an uplifting idea? And so the use of the color white, perhaps as, as a symbol of hope, would be something that, you know, you perhaps did? Or is there oh, more? Oh, sorry, to I, didn't, I didn't get the question. I'm sorry. Sorry, sometimes I ramble a little bit. Um, so with you now explaining that you kind of kept him as you saw him, but you changed mm -hmm. the horse and you changed the landscape. The, the white horse has always represented um, hope, um, you know, perhaps yeah. perseverance, something very positive and uplifting. Is that why you chose the horse to be white? Yeah, it's also um, the, the horse is white. And that's why also the, the character has dark clothes, because even though I kept like his contemporary clothes, um, I made the clothes a little darker so it could contrast with the horse. And once again, it's this duality. I'm not sure here I wanted to to talk about like um, good or, 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 I mean, light and dark. But certainly, as you mentioned, uh, the, the hope is definitely part of this horse. And the fact that the guy is dressed in dark, it's because, as, as I said, he might have a tough life. So he's coming from a less bright background. So... Yeah, what you say totally makes sense. And I, I can truly see that. When I first saw this piece, when you had completed it, he did not have an evil or an ominous feel. He felt very human to me and, and very mm -hmm. relatable. And I think, you know, in this sense, using the more contemporary clothes helps ground that, where he doesn't represent a figure of death or of something dark to come. And the fact that he is joined with this white, beautiful, very majestic horse I think further perpetuates that. And so yeah. with the landscape being not of India, but of someplace else, why did you choose to have the rocks that overlook the sea and with that bit of sky? Is that a particular place or was it something that yeah, you imagined it's... and put together to represent the piece? Yeah, it's, in, it's something from my imagination, but I wanted something very desertic because one of the idea of this painting too is that charisma, it's not a matter of, of wealth. It's more a matter of soul. Because what came to my mind when I looked at this boy is like, how can he impress me so much without talking while he is like wearing flip-flops and a, just a short on his pants? And that made me also wonder. And this desert, desert landscape is here um, to, to, how to say it? Why the, the guy on the, the boy on horse has a, the, there's a kind of light behind his head just above. It's also to symbolize that um, it's all a matter of your mind, of your soul, of your spirit and everything. So this desert, desertic landscape for me was symbolizing the, the, the field of consciousness somehow. When you're inside of you and it's like, there's nothing, it's just you with yourself and, and yeah. For uh, <laughs> no, it makes sorry, perfect sense. In my words, but yeah, no. symbolizing the the, the 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 inner life somehow. Uh, that's why there is no one around. There is nothing. It's just the sea and this kind of desertic 
rock ground, rocky ground. Absolutely. I mean, when the mind is quiet, it awaits what's next, whether it's your thought or that next experience you take on. So this is, you know, in some sense, then perhaps a, a, a turning point. This is that calm before in mm -hmm. many senses too. Yeah, and the wind is pushing from left to right. So to the sense the horse moves. So it's also, once again, here to mention the, uh, the to move on also, always this kind of hope kind of message and go forward yeah absolutely and it's a very beautiful message and so Thank you. this you're welcome this figure was then taken from an actual person so you used your photographic reference to bring him to this particular scene but in other pieces you've actually created um figures you know these human mm -hmm. um, allegories from your mind so tell us a bit more about why you choose sometimes to use that reference and why other times it's more appropriate than to create um this this person from your own um imaginings so actually it depends on the process sometimes you walk in the street or near the seashore like in india and you see something and you see a painting you're like whoa this is a painting i need to picture it and sometimes you are in your studio, laying on the couch, and you wander, looking at the ceiling, and then you start seeing paintings in your mind, and then you have to find a way to to bring them to life. So sometimes from the, you find your painting outside, and sometimes you find it inside. So according to where you find it, then you adjust your references. It makes sense. It makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. So. Our next question says, I love that I feel like the horse is also as important as the boy in terms of character. It's like it complements the whole scene. Mm -hmm. so I yeah, agree. exactly. Yeah, I also agree. It's true. It's, as you said, the horse is also somehow the boy and the boy is the horse. They, they could yes. be the, they, they could symbolize one another. So for me, they're the same. <clears throat> Absolutely. I mean, the boy is in everyday clothes. They don't represent wealth. Um, they just represent perhaps normalcy and with his flip flops and his striped shorts. But the horse is a re very regal and very majestically painted being. And there's this luminosity and, and this, this boldness that represents the person inside those clothes, that young boy. And it's, it's exactly. a very beautiful representation of him. And so that was a, a great, great, great point. And you know, it's, again, there's so much hope and, and beauty, despite, you know, diversity and, and the odds that might get their adversity, rather, and the odds that get thrown our way as humans. But we come out of it always, and it's very empowering. Yeah, great, uh, great comment from that person. She, yeah, pointed well. Yes, thank you for that. Um, so, oh, someone had asked earlier, I'm sorry. Um, this is Matthew Rosier, and... Um, if you guys tune in later, we'll have this up live for about 24 hours on our story. So you can kind of catch up on what you missed up on. Um, so I'd like to learn more about your process and share that with everyone watching. So you begin in a drawing phase and you evolve into painting. So do you have any examples you can show us? And would you mind letting us know more about that process? Yeah, sure. So my process, the aim of my process before starting a painting is to be able to have a clean reference from something that doesn't exist. So that's the challenge. So I might sometime make people pose if I can and in certain position that I need, or other time I just go on the internet and scroll trying to find the image. And some other time I would just like draw to directly from imagination. So I, in the end, I'm juggling between these three approaches and I try on Photoshop to, to build a single image where I crop, where I repaint, where I speed paint over photos, where I crop elements, pass them here and there. Somehow doing like, I don't know how you call that in English, a maquette, you know? Yeah, a maquette. That works yeah. a, a digital yeah. composition. You know, you're collaging these elements together, but you're making them into one cohesive story and world. Yeah, exactly. And once I have this document, uh, which is more or less representing altogether the scene I have in mind, then I start to to, to paint it. So I, first I draw the composition on the, on, the, on the panel quite carefully. So then it allows me to be more free with paint afterward. And usually I start full paste, like I'm not gonna 
layer one after another. I, I directly fit the, the surface so the painting is more consistent. And then in two or three layer, the painting will be done. I can show you some examples here I have. For instance, here's a sketch of research just like a for, for a posture. So here, I started sketching the holes and the character and I didn't like the composition, so I stopped. Then I tried another time and I felt like maybe this time it's better. So I developed more the, the rendering. Ah. Yeah. And, but still, it, it was not really what I wanted. So all this is... Uh, after I have the reference on Photoshop, so it's after all the kind of puzzling I do on the computer. So then I started doing something else uh, on a small scale in painting. Another position. And then it was still not okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I changed it again. And finally, on the final panel, I found the final composition. So that's like a work in progress, but the composition is is like, is done. So in this case, then you started off obviously digitally, but then you worked with your drawing that, as you mentioned before, tends to be a bit more, I guess, involved because you want to get all the kinks out when you're in that phase. So then when you paint, you can have a looser and perhaps more freeing approach. So in this case, you took to the drawing, but then you went and you painted to actually get to that goal and that place where you were happy with that particular um, posture and that, that piece. So... Why did you find that, or why do you think that working in paint allowed you to achieve that that perfect feel for what you wanted in that painting? Yeah. Um, when you paint, somehow you're asking yourself, you, you what you meant is why I would find the answers while painting and not while drawing or sketching yes. or whatever. Yeah. Yes. Because when you paint, you're asking yourself uh, questions about painting. When you're sketching, you're asking yourself, questions about composition, line, whatever, but then you might not um, face some, some issues that you might have with painting. So sometimes when I'm struggling with the sketch like this, I don't really know, I would start painting, well, in little like this one, but so I have the, the feeling of paint and then I, I can somehow put aside some not so important problems that I thought was were important and other problems that are very important that I didn't think about are like popping from the from the from the panel or the canvas on whatever you work on so that's sometimes when you're blocked in drawing and you switch to painting then it flows it's a bit strange but that makes great sense and it's an excellent approach and one because mm -hmm. I don't paint and I don't draw I've never thought of before so I thank you for teaching me that. Mm -hmm. And um, let me see, next question. There's a strong sense of perspective and space within your environments and architecture. Do you have any recommendations for how to study perspective? Do you have any what, sorry? Oh, any recommendations for how to study perspective? Well, actually <laughs> this afternoon, I'm working on a new composition now, which is like full of elements and I was doing uh, perspective the whole afternoon and I was like oh my god perspective <laughs> so yeah um, perspective it's about understanding very simple rules that can apply to very complex uh, situations you shouldn't think it the way around you shouldn't think like perspective is super complex and to draw a simple cube is going to be so hard it's the way around there is a simple way to understand perspective that's gonna allow you to draw very, very crazy complex things with buildings, with architecture or whatever. So try to really master the very simple rules with like vanishing points and like one point perspective, two point perspective, perspective sorry, three point perspective. And once you're confident with that, you're gonna see that it's a very simple thing that is applying to, yeah, much more complex stuff. But the, the worst, the, the main thing not to do in perspective is to approach it with, uh, with fear and thinking it's complex. Because when I have students, why they usually 
get lost is because in their mind they're already assuming it's super complex and then they're like pressuring themselves and sometimes they they don't how to say they make mistakes because they are too focused while the rules is very simple that's a great answer and, and a great point and mm -hmm. soon we'll be approaching the hour mark which means that instagram will kick us off the story but if everyone doesn't mind if we're still going i will create that live story again Matthew okay, will join sure. us and we'll kind of finish up. So I apologize when that happens because I do foresee it happening soon. Um, so our next question, do you think that we live in a society that cultivates or curtails creativity? Con considering factors such as social media, guidelines, public scrutiny, and prudishness, does artistic freedom really exist? So, sorry, my English is not that good. I don't understand the word crudeness. So... I don't, how would I just how would we explain crudeness? Um, like, the like crude behavior. Um, it's a oh, funny word. Like something mean or yes, yeah, in like okay. poor taste. Um, something very um, like base. I would say. Mm. So the question is: Is our society now something uh, a creative society or like a crude society? I guess. Do we think um, as artist? Do you think as an artist? Um, does artistic freedom truly exist? Because you're battling social mm -hmm. media guidelines, public scrutiny, um, prudishness towards artistic um, form sometimes. There's, I think, because oh, okay. of uh, how much we can communicate now and how much is readily available to us because of social media especially, do you find that that um, cultivates or, cr or curtails or stops or gets in the way of your creativity? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I think it's a matter of trying to put everything at its place. Um, if you're an artist, your job is to become at some point free in your mind, free in your work, and hope and to hope that this is going to spread around and will somehow inspire people. Um, so I think wherever you live in the world, <clears throat> whatever is the situation around you, if aiming to, towards freedom is already being free somehow, it's who that knows if we'll ever, yeah, who knows if we'll ever be free because there will always be something in between. Even if you're living in a perfect world and something maybe wrong happens next to you, then you won't feel totally free because you know, freedom is something that is shared. If not, if you're the only person which is free and around people like tight, then you're, you can't say you're really free. So this general freedom, I don't know if we can achieve this because as you look at history, it's, you know, it's always like that. I mean, it's dictated like, by so that... many things. Sorry? Oh, it's dictated by many things too on the business perspective as far as if yeah. you're making a living as an artist, you know, will certain themes or certain stories sell a bit more than others? And how much do you have to consider that? Because it's, if this is your livelihood and what you're relying upon to live, how does that factor come into play too? Mm, yeah. Uh, <laughs> maybe maybe I answered the side of the question. I don't know. Was I still in the subject or? No, I think you did. And I think that it's important oh. to note also that for the elements through social media and technology and, and life that, that upset us or dissuade us as artists because you're taking in everything on a subconscious and conscious level, there are going to be many times where you will react to such things. So for the dark moments, perhaps because you have that bit of hope and that light, you will then react to that dark moment by reinterpreting it because you are that creative and you have that talent to something that has a different perspective and a different outcome. And in turn, yeah. that, you know, it helps the situation. It brings light and it brings hope to your audience too. Yeah, being an artist is having the, the tool to make what you have in go out. So it's a very important emotional parachute uh, mm -hmm. during, during the hard times you can have in life, like you said. And it's also a certain responsibility because it means you have the power and the possibility to share 
something with the world, with your painting, your music, your writing, whatever. Absolutely. And that's why aiming for freedom, as I said earlier, is very important because this will... Uh, Can you pick up that piece of paper, Joseph, that's over there for me? Please. It's my notes. Okay, guys, we're trying it again. I'm sorry for that. Okay. Here we go. And hi, everybody, again. And here comes Matthew. Nice. Okay, we're back. Sorry about that. And so it, the... Um, story cut you off when you were saying how as an artist you have the tools to kind of control that narrative yeah you you can control that narrative um because you're an artist and you you work to create re images that are easy to read and i was saying that as long as you aim for freedom then your work will be beneficial for others because it contains like um the right seeds Absolutely. And I think a very simple and, and, you know, basic notion, but an important one is that when someone's painting, they're painting something that's readable to everybody. Because in Matthew's case, these are these are figures, these are stories, these are landscapes, and these are allegories. And even in the respective abstract artists, you know, these are things that people are understanding from all over the world of all different backgrounds, cultures, experiences through this visual um, expression. And I think that's an incredible force because it, it brings people together, whereas sometimes language will separate people because of those not being fluent in different tongues. And sometimes, you know, writings as well from different periods might be difficult for people to digest because that language was different, although it might be still that same language, there's different um, contextual and societal elements. And as an artist, you kind of pervade all of that and you're creating things that are understandable and enjoyable for everyone. And it's, it's a very incredible thing. Yeah, uh, everyone which is a painter or visual artist has to, to notice that um, we have a, an enormous luck to, be, to, to make a visual art so we can talk to everyone. Mm -hmm. If you're a writer, you're writing in your language. If you're a poet, you're writing in your language. So paintings, painting and drawing allows us to, to, to be really universal. And that's, that's a great gift from the medium. Absolutely. And it's a great gift to all of us, too, that, you know, through you and, and your mind and your experiences, you're sharing these stories and these emotions and just pure beauty also, which uplifts us mm -hmm. and moves and teaches us, too. So a couple more yeah, questions have popped up, which I'm excited about. Um, how do you measure the success of an image? Do you judge it by personal satisfaction, online engagement, or by the amount of money it makes? Hmm. I think, I think it's first the, 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 before having the quality of the image, it's more the quality of your thought, because the image is the result of your thought. Mm -hmm. So first, I am analyzing if my idea makes sense, if what I want to say is meaningful enough to be painted. And if I find that the, the sense, uh, the message is something important, then my second goal is to make an image that has enough impact that it can spread that message by itself. And I'm not obliged to be next to the painting explaining to the people, blah, 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 blah. blah. So then it, it <laughs> then it becomes like visual challenge, how to balance your composition, how to paint it in a way that it, it has like an impact. When you enter the room, it's like on the wall, you know, it's, there's like energy. So that's the technical challenge. But first I will judge the quality of an artwork from the idea, I mean, the, the, the content. And, and I then about the money, not really, because money is more linked with um, the career of the person, not really in an artwork in particular. And I think that, you know, with this genre and artists like you and your work, it's it's beyond that. I mean, you are certainly not getting what you deserve um, with the price points that, you know, we're all currently at as far as your technical prowess and the depth and the beauty that you achieve with your work. 
But I think that from my experience, meeting collectors for many, many years and artists, we're all in this for more than just the financial aspect. I mean, everyone has to eat and pay mm. their bills, but that I think is towards the back of all our intentions as we're all connecting and relating over very potent and very human content. And there may be different levels of academic principle that upon further you know, experience and study of the works, you will find that. But at the end of the day, these are all very relatable and very heartfelt and I think are extremely connecting. And so, you know, at least with, with Haven and all our artists that, you know, we work with, obviously we want our artists to keep painting. We want to compensate them for all they do. But I think that everyone's intention is, is it's about sharing a story and making some kind of impression on that viewer where they are now learning and changing too, just as the artist is when they explore their own content. Yeah, I totally agree. So a question that I'm wondering about, um, and it's, you know, with a bit of background with the gallery, we have so many different works of art that come through our doors and they're all framed differently. And there's many principles behind why an artist frames the work the, in the way that they do. And sometimes when the work finds its home, it's reframed. And it's always quite interesting to see those collectors that acquire work and leave the frame as is because they find that that is the artist's intention for presentation and they don't want to change that. But on the other end, it's always quite fascinating when artists all, I mean, sorry, when collectors change the framing to represent the style of their home or of who they are a bit mm -hmm. more and kind of taking that, that personal liberty when they own that work of art to do so. So your work is very historical to me. It's very traditional, um, but it has significant stories and, and meanings that span all of humanity because it represents the human condition. So it's interesting for me to see your work framed in a very modern and min minimalist frame because your work is exactly the opposite of that for me personally. So I'd love to know more about your selection of frame style. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, for me, the frame should be here to somehow um, cut the painting from what's around. It, the frame is is somehow making the painting look like a window on a certain universe. It, it, it puts border around it so the viewer can really enter in it. So that's the first um, reason why I frame. And second, I use minimalistic frame because for me, it should stay, as I said, like a window. It, sh it, it shouldn't attract attention. It's here to, um, to, to add uh, how can I explain that? In it? Um, it's here to add depth to the work, yes. but it's it's not here to to attract the eye. So if I have like a very heavy kind of old school frame, um, the frame is going to become as important as the work. So I keep my frame very minimalistic, so they they are always under the painting in terms of. Uh, the, the hierarchy of, of uh, uh, center of interest. And they certainly do do that. They control the eye, which artists typically want to do in what, you know, they're doing compositionally with values, with color or lack of color or thereof, but you are controlling mm -hmm. that perspective. So because you have the idea of this painting floating in its frame through that style of framing, you're now having mm -hmm. that eye go straight into the painting and it's an encapsulation of that painting rather than it, um, like an accoutrement or um, a further embellishment, as you mentioned, with maybe more flashy or heavier frames. And I, I think it, it's quite effective. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's also a matter of contrast, because now you know that I like contrast. Yes. Um, it's like one day I met a, a friend, which was a, well, a guy which became my friend, and he's a musician. And we're playing guitars. And um, he was a professional musician. I'm just like a hobbyist. so. Uh, he was playing a, a rhythm, you know, and I was doing like a solo on it. But uh, uh, he was doing like very crazy kind of rhythm guitar. And I was doing a very kind of uh, like trying to be doing a crazy solo. And he told me, man, uh, just calm down. He said, <laughs> if the rhythm is crazy, your solo should be laid back, uh, should be calm. If the rhythm is, is, is simple then your solo should be very complex. And this very simple sentence stayed in my mind and I said, that makes so much sense. I'm gonna apply it to art. If you have an image which is very detailed, very busy, 
uh, then you want something around that creates a balance. So you want something quite minimalistic. And as, as long as oil painting and figurative painting in the style I, I use, the, st uh, the figurative style I use is quite complex, I want my frames to be quite minimalistic. And probably if I would do monochromes, I would have a way more complex frame, who knows? I definitely can see that. And I think it's a great thing for us all to think about in life in general, whether we're artists or not. And mostly mm -hmm. people might see contrast as something that could be a little harsh or combative. And really it just represents the balance of life because there's always the opposite available for everything that we experience. And so it's a bit more realistic and grounding too. So yeah, exactly. You can be, you can, oh, sorry. Oh no, please keep going. Now, say you can be uh, extreme as long as you have the other extreme to balance. If you have like two extreme on the same side, your work is going to... Yeah, exactly. Gonna, I'm gonna work. Yeah. There's so much to take into account. And artists have a very big mm -hmm. job, always. It's never a change, no matter how much you experience you have or what you've studied or um, any of that. There's always new questions and new challenges. And it's a very exciting, mm -hmm. but... I'm sure frustrating job, you know, and passion. So I think maybe, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Um, so someone's asking, how are you, Matthew? Hope you're staying safe. Um, I'm going through, and I'm not familiar with this, Bargs, um, Corée de Dessin. Are there any courses or references you recommend? Oh, um, there are many. I think the first reference is museum. If you are lucky enough to have a museum in your city, just go there as much as you can because you're gonna see basically the the results that you're you're aiming toward. So being in a museum allows you to to see great work, to study by looking, to to basic to to have the problems you have in your studio to have them solved on the wall. Like going to the museum is bringing you a lot of answers. So that's a very important uh, reference. Second, I would say books um, and tutorials that you can find on the internet. Um, so I have many book references that I could uh, I could like list. But yeah, just try to find like good quality art books. And um, what is very important is to have good references. If you have, uh, if you look at strong painters, if you have like great drawing books and everything, it's gonna it's going to educate your taste so you know what where you have to aim and you're going to go way faster. So the quality of the reference is very important. And the last, I think, last but not least, is people. Like you just meet other artists, discuss and exchange. And yeah, so to summarize, probably first is like uh, art history. That is the best teacher. Second would be like uh, books. And third, uh, humans. I think that's all great advice. So I think all my questions have been fulfilled. If anyone else has anything, now is the time to throw it out there. And Matthew, is there anything else that you'd like to touch on with regard to the work or yourself or anything else? Well, no, I think we, yeah, we... I said all I, I could say. Yeah, thank you so much for your questions and thank you everyone for your questions. That was, uh, that was great. Yeah, I really appreciate the questions. They were great and your answers were fantastic as well. And you've taught me mm -hmm. quite a bit, um, as all these stories are. And it's, it's really wonderful to be able to connect with you. And, you know, we weren't going to be able to meet in person for now anyway. So this is, is definitely, I think, satiating that for me. And for everyone interested, if you'd like to ask any further questions, I'm available always. You can DM me or email me. These works just arrived and they're all available. We haven't posted information yet on them because we do plan to debut them in person at an art fair in the Hamptons this July with some other pieces. But nonetheless, we have them um, as well as their details. So please email or DM us if you'd like more information. And always remember, we do payment plans. So these things can be managed and spread out. So everyone is quite comfortable. But our artists always get compensated first. Um, and that's pretty much it. So we hope you guys are all staying well. And thank you again, Matthew. And we'll all talk soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Erika. Thank you, everyone. And we'll be in touch very soon. Thank you once again. Thanks, guys. And be safe. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. Goodbye.